Welcome to the module Immersion in Water for Labour and Birth, Safety and Considerations. Water for Labour and Birth is becoming increasingly popular throughout the United Kingdom and throughout the world. Although they're increasing in popularity, there are some safety considerations that we must take into account. Midwives who are conducting the water births must be prepared for the very rare but serious emergencies should they happen when caring for women in the pool. The aims and objectives of this second module are Gain knowledge of physiology to underpin your safety considerations when caring for women in the pool. Review of care to maintain safety of mother and baby in the pool. And an overview of the management of emergencies in the pool. And also an overview of approaches to evacuation of a collapsed woman. Caring for women in water and supporting them to give birth is a crucial element of our midwifery practice. Like all care that we provide, we must be aware of safety considerations, maintaining a safe environment and in those rare occasions, how to manage our emergencies in the pool. Now let's review some safety considerations. The first area that we're going to look at is whether or not a baby will breathe underwater when a woman has chosen to have her baby in the pool. During normal labour and birth, fetal breathing movements, which happen in the latter weeks of pregnancy, prepare the baby for ex-utero life. These are suppressed due to hormonal conditions during labour. The birth environment becomes mildly hypoxic, which further decreases the fetal respiratory movements. In combination, these conditions make it unlikely that a baby will gasp whilst underwater. Furthermore, the dive reflex, which is present in neonates, may serve as an additional protective physiology. The dive reflex closes the larynx in response to water on the face or the mouth. The stimulation of the baby underwater, or any baby who is severely hypoxic prior to birth, may increase the chances of the baby breathing under the water. There is no need to assess for the nuchal cord around the neck or to apply any downward traction of the fetal head at the time of birth. Now let's review the safety considerations when supporting women who labour in water or who give birth in the pool. The pool temperature of the pool should ideally remain between 37 degrees Celsius and should never exceed 37.5 degrees Celsius. There are two main reasons for these recommendations. If the mother is subjected to prolonged periods of heat, she may develop a pyrexia. The fetus is at 1 degree Celsius higher than the mother and if she develops a pyrexia, the fetal physiology may respond and increase the need for oxygen, thus increasing potential for hypoxia. To avoid these complications, it is recommended that pool temperature and the temperature of the mother is taken hourly and recorded in maternal notes. Now that we've reviewed the pool temperature, let's have a look at umbilical cord issues. When supporting women who choose to remain in the pool for birth, the umbilical cord may present an issue at the time of birth. In this section, we will briefly review these potential issues and how to manage them cord around the neck. As discussed earlier, there is no need to check for the umbilical cord prior to full expulsion from the birth canal. If the baby is born with a cord around its neck or body, slowly, gently turn the baby to unravel the cord and bring it to the surface. Baby who has a short cord. If the baby has a short umbilical cord, you may not be able to bring the baby to the surface of the pool without damaging or severing the unclamped cord. In this situation, ask the mother to stand up and bring the baby to the surface as she does so. Remember that the baby's face should not re-enter the pool. Cord avulsion or a snapped cord. This is a very uncommon event, but should the cord snap, remove the baby from the pool, clamping the remaining part of the cord. This can be an emergency situation as the baby can potentially lose significant amounts of blood. Try and assess the baby and make arrangements for a transfer assessment by the neonatal team as per your local protocols. Shoulder dystocia. Shoulder dystocia is a bony impact of the posterior shoulder on the anterior pubic bone. It is an obstetric emergency and local guidelines should discuss the management of the mother and neonate in this situation. It is uncommon in the pool as most women adopt upright positions which opens the pelvis to a wider diameter. Recognising when a shoulder dystocia may be occurring is essential. A shoulder dystocia may be assumed if the body is not born within a contraction or two following the birth of the fetal head. Other signs of shoulder dystocia may present such as non-restitution of the head or turtling of the chin. Ask the mother to exit the pool and explain why. Mothers will understand the urgency of the situation and will generally be able to exit on their own. 
guard the fetal head as she exits. Be prepared to catch the baby at any time as movement of the mother may dislodge any bony impact and the body may be born. You could also ask the mother to place a foot on the edge of the pool to see if this dislodges the fetal head. Once exited the pool, follow local protocol for the management of shoulder dystocia. Let's look at estimating blood loss in the pool and postpartum hemorrhage. Estimating blood loss in the pool is very challenging. If you suspect that the mother may be continuing to bleed, you may notice the pool bottom becoming murky or darker. The mother may start to feel unwell. Please ask her to exit the pool before she enters into an unconscious state. Drain the pool and collect any clots for measuring. Initiate your local postpartum hemorrhage protocols. Now that we've looked at estimating blood loss in the pool and postpartum hemorrhage, let's review infection control procedures. Infection control issues often arise when discussing water births. It is essential that you have local pool cleaning policies in place and refer to the manufacturer of your pool for further cleaning instructions. Regular water testing to assess the absence of harmful bacteria should also be carried out as per your local policies. Research has found that infection risks to mother and baby is often cited as a barrier for promoting the use of water for labour and birth. The Cochrane Review in 2009 did not find any increased risks of infection to mother or baby who had had a water birth. Now that we've reviewed infection control procedures, let's look at managing a collapsed woman in the pool. This is a very rare occurrence, but it is often a major focus for clinicians when considering developing a water birth service. How to remove a collapsed woman from the pool is often a contentious issue with the health and safety teams. However, removal from the pool can be straightforward and does not necessarily require expensive equipment. For the safety of the women and the staff, it is paramount that staff are trained and prepared for pool emergency evacuations. Local guidelines need to be in place to support your practice and these need to be initiated when a woman collapses in the pool. Some key pointers are, make sure that you call for help as per your local guidelines and policies. Stabilize the mother. Remember, do not pull the plug. Fill the pool up to the rim. This reduces the mother's relative body weight by up to 33%, making it easier for her to be removed from the pool. Follow local remover procedures, allowing the mother to come straight from the pool onto a trolley or movable bed. Transport the mother for assistance as per your local policies. With training and preparation, staff should feel confident to manage this very rare emergency.